Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Dyslexia Life Hacks Show. I'm your host, Matthew Head, and in this episode, I'm talking to Richard Purcell. He is the co-founder of CareScribe, which has two projects, Captioned and TalkType. Captioned is an AI-powered note-taking software where TalkType deals with dictation. He's previously been a doctor and the founder of a, a software called Medincore that assists people with medical jargon and terminology. As always, I'll put links to CareScribe and other things we talk about in the show notes, which will be available at dyslexialifehacks.com forward slash podcast. Welcome to the show, Richard. Thanks very much. Nice to be here. Thanks for thanks for the invite, Matthew. No problem at all. So where I wanted to start off with this conversation is studying to be a doctor. Um, I've had a doctor on the podcast before, but they weren't dyslexic themselves. But a doctorate and doing medical stuff seems like quite a difficult thing to study as a dyslexic person. Uh, yeah, uh, I think probably kind of yes, probably yes and no. Um, yeah. I I think so. My I guess in my schooling, I was um, I was I was kind of good at two kind of opposites. I was good at uh, in, in in arts, so I was, I, was, I was very interested in in the arts and um, very practical subjects, and I, I was interested in or, or succeeded in in science. Mm. Um, struggling in those kind of uh, those language subjects, you know, anything basically that involved any any significant writing or anything like that, I'd, I'd kind of struggle in. Um, and um, once I started to get su- some support at school, which was quite late on, actually, um, it became you know going to university and um, became became an option. And um, and, uh, and 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 you know, and studying a, 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 a sometimes you know more challenging course like medicine became an option um, as well. Um, I managed to get into medical school. As I say, it was a bit. It was quite late. I got the support, and the support at school made a massive difference. So, um, um, when I got into to medical school, I certainly found it very challenging. There was no, um, there was no kind of doubt, uh, kind of yeah, doubt about that. I, I kind of felt very out of my depth. But the the good thing about medicine is it's pretty much all or the the, the university that I went to is pretty much all um, uh, multiple choice question exams. <laughs> so very little, you know. So you got basically. The 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 the, um, the the sort of science part of it was was all kind of uh, uh, multiple choice exams. So I didn't have to write essays and write theses and things like that, which I would find oh, pretty much impossible. Um, and uh, what mm. I did uh, have to do um, was multiple choice exams, and then there's the practical stuff, which um, I found uh, you know I, I was I was more than capable of doing, and the communication work as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah. So those sorts of things came naturally to me. Um, Learning huge swathes of information, not so much. Um, no. uh, but one thing I tend to do is just, uh, yeah, try and get my head down. And, and I always think if, uh, if I'm not as smart as somebody else, I can certainly work as hard, if not harder. So, yeah, <laughs> that tended to uh, to get me through. Yeah, that sounds great. And I, I imagine dyslexic visual skills really help being a doctor in terms of you know, imagining I did a hypothetical, for example, a disease prop going through the body. and You can kind of visualize it all moving through. And that's kind of how you worked it out in your head, maybe. Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, when it came to things like anatomy and things like that was that again came very naturally to me. I could kind of think in those kind of uh kind of uh 3D uh sort of forms. That was was never a uh, a difficulty. The other thing I tended to find is for me to sort of commit things to to memory, I very much had to I couldn't I couldn't rote learn. You know, mm. I had to I had to understand core concepts which um it's quite good in medicine to give you. You have to work really hard to to, to do that. But, you know, it's it's a lot easier. I think just to, to if you can just remember facts and pages of textbooks. Yeah, but yeah. I'd have to do research and kind of go right back to kind of core principles, which then was very useful later on because if you understand things to a, if you really understand things, then you can build on that knowledge. And I found that was 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 quite uh, quite useful in in you know in just the way I kind of naturally naturally learned. Um, so yeah, kind of going back to to core basics. Some areas of medicine that's quite difficult because that you know the, there are gaps in knowledge in medicine and you know and in, in some pretty prominent places you know. But um, and so you'd you'd end up hitting a brick wall and there'd be no answer to that question. And um, but yeah, yeah, and I, I could see that the benefits of not rote learning some of the particularly some of the early stuff because you're building yourself a massive foundation. So it's almost like you take the hit early on that pays off as you get more and more into the detail. 
Exactly. Yeah. So the the university I went to, which was the University of Bristol, um, oh, yeah. is a um, is a very um, traditional kind of university. So their structure is yeah. three years of um, of kind of lectures, or at least two years and a, and a bit of of kind of nine to five lectures, um, and then uh, kind of the the what you kind of call the clinical work. So you get you know you get on the wards and you um, you start to, um, to to do some more of the practical things and the kind of interacting more with patients and i certainly found those kind of three years of, of a huge amount of information usually in a format that really wasn't suited to my mm-hmm. way of learning incredibly challenging um, yeah and yeah. uh yeah i sort of yeah um uh, my way of dealing with that really was just to to get my head down and think well i might be struggling more than any, anybody else but i could really uh you know I, I can work harder so you know i just kind of spent a lot a lot of time um just just working hard really and, and trying to commit things to memory being relentless basically pretty much yeah, yeah. <laughs> there is a i think a bit a degree of relentlessness does help doesn't it? particularly when you get into complicated university studies yeah absolutely absolutely so you mentioned that you, I assume at some point in late in schooling is when you found out you're dyslexic and got some extra support. So where, how did that come about? Um, yeah, so um, I, yeah, kind of like I described really, I was, um, I was, I was good at uh, sort of sciences. I was kind of doing pretty well at, and I was good at art, but I was, I was always struggling in anything English based. I, I was really struggling and um mm-hmm. Uh, to the extent that it was just, you know, you look back at my old sort of school reports, it was so obvious, you know, it was kind of, yeah, you know, <laughs> A's over here and kind of failing over over here. And um, kind of I got, I I, I wasn't, I, well, I didn't have a diagnosis of dyslexia until a bit later on. So it was kind of, you know, you'd sort of sit, sit in parents' evening and you'd kind of, it would be a bit of kind of maybe he just applies himself more or anything, ah, anything like that. But, it, you know, it didn't never really add it up. Yeah, it's such a frustrating thing. But, um, but then... Um, uh, yeah, I probably should have got a diagnosis earlier. The dyslexia runs in my family, and it just kind of I don't think um, for whatever reason it, I don't know if it crossed uh, crossed our minds. But when I did get a dyslexia diagnosis, and then um, so it made the school aware. They were they were fantastic, and they just oh, sort of, uh, adapted a little bit in the way they were kind of teaching me. Offered me a little bit of extra uh, sort of um, support. Um, I was reasonably close to my GCSEs at the time, so. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they, they kind of really, really helped, helped out um, in sort of, you know, trying to uh, sort of kind of last minute prepare me in, in, in the ways they could. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which kind of got got me through those exams and, you know, made sure I kind of uh, passed all the ones I, I, I kind of could. And yeah, and it was, yeah, it was just kind of, um, I think, I think uh, the approach to learning and the things that were happening in some classes that were very detrimental to me kind of stopped happening. Things like, reading it out loud from a book uh, you know which yeah. has had uh, i can see now like further down the line has had really significant impacts on me and uh, and and the way uh, i've kind of developed because uh, you know that is just not um any any good for me no. you know, I, I just i just cannot do that so yeah. um i had long-term problems with public speaking which took me a long time to overcome which kind of stemmed from that kind of being put on the spot trying to trying to uh to read out of a book and just failing miserably in front of my uh, my class so things like that got kind of addressed and uh, i got kind of the support i needed which was yeah excellent okay and then rolling into university did you then get like assistive technology and support like that or yeah, so I went, um, yeah, so I kind of got through my GCSEs, uh, A-level time came around and I had that extra bit of support uh, in, you know, when I sort of moved on to A-levels. Um, so did did really well there, which was great. And then I applied through the the, the DSA, so the Disabled yep. Students Allowance, uh, and got some uh, hardware and, and software to support me in my in my studies. So yeah, so I had those had those tools kind of going into into university which was um which was really useful I, I didn't i didn't quite get all the value i kind of wanted out of some of the the kit but uh, what i essentially ended up doing in the end was building a bit of tech that i i wish i had <laughs> when i i started um and um yeah myself and a friend of mine kind of teamed up and built a bit of uh, a bit of tech and that kind of turned into my first uh, assistive tech business Yes, yes. So before we get into your system tech business, what sort of tech did you have at university? Um, gosh, now that's a test. I had uh, I had some mind mapping software. Uh, I had uh, okay. some dictation software, yeah. uh, and um, I also had uh, I'm trying to remember. I had some note taking software as well. Okay, cool, yeah. cool. 
Uh, and they also had a, uh, a um, uh, had a uh, gosh, which got a digi- uh, digital voice recorder as well. Yes, which, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I think I had all of them. I just never ever used it. <laughs> yeah. I think I was the same. Yeah, so, uh, uh, no, no, I'm not going to put this in the front of that chair. <laughs> I, could, I could never remember to charge it. I think that was the problem. Oh, my had <laughs> uh, replaceable batteries even worse. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you then rolled out into work as a doctor. Did you take any assistive technology with you or what sort of strategies were you using as a doctor at that point? I mean, doctors as a whole are notorious for having really bad note taking and writing anyway as a bit of a stereotype yeah, <laughs> yeah too right I'll t- uh, yeah I'll, yeah there's some real challenges when you kind of uh, yeah when you get, get into sort of uh in, onto the wards i guess kind of one of the challenges of being a i didn't i didn't to answer your question i didn't i didn't really take any of uh uh, any of the software forward, I don't think, other than um, mainly because I think a lot of the tools that I was using in in education were very focused on um, on on learning. So you know, uh, being in lecture theatres, being in seminars, things like that. Whilst uh, when on the wards, it's very kind of on your feet, practical practical job. So yeah, um, yeah. they didn't they didn't really translate for me. Um, I still used a few things. I used my dictation software. Um, I used the bit of tech that um, myself and a, a colleague had built, which kind of I became quite reliant on, uh, and a few other a few other bits. But um, no, I didn't really take uh, a lot of the a lot of the software I had. But yeah, certainly came up against a lot of challenges. Um, you know, uh, one of the key ones is um, when I went into the NHS, uh, you didn't really have digital digital notes so um you know oh, medical yeah. records were all paper so yeah. Uh, <laughs> kind of, yeah like these massive binders of uh, patient notes um that you had to both filter through so if you wanted any information about the patient you had to flick through these notes and a hundred different people's handwriting mm. to try and decipher mm. you know usually writing pretty complicated terminologies and lexicon you know to try and decipher exactly what they've said but then also going around on things like ward rounds with this kind of relatively flimsy paper folder, trying to uh, to, to scrawl what what uh, you know your your seniors are saying uh, yeah, alongside yeah. the patient and balance this thing on your knee, um, was, <laughs> yeah, and that kind of you know challenge of kind of your auditory working memory and processing what's being said, and then mm. also sort of writing it down. I found that incredibly difficult, and nothing could really prepare you for that until you were you were there. What did you do to? Um... Make that easier on yourself. Apart from uh, start a company. <laughs> yeah, um, <laughs> I guess. Uh, thanks. Thankfully, that kind of process of kind of, uh, of, of I guess what you, you call it in, in, in medicine, being the being the scribe, is um, is relatively relatively short lived. Um, uh, so I did I did do it for do it for a very long uh, and. Um, and yeah, and and it was really just a, a case of I think just having to work that again that extra extra bit harder, you know, really kind of uh, focus on, um, on on what's being said, and, um, and and yeah, it was just kind of practice makes perfect, I think. But it was it was it was really difficult. Often, if I was with a you know another colleague of uh, who who would we we try and alternate maybe the role, so you know like, you know we could kind of catch up in between patients. But it was yeah, really really challenging. You know, you've got sometimes. A consultant who's flying around the the patient, just scribbling the notes down as fast as you can, <laughs> trying to find the next notes, trying to get some new paper, and all of this sort of stuff. Yeah, it's yeah, uh, yeah stressful, stressful environment. Uh, yeah, it's already a stressful environment. Let alone with that built on top of it. <laughs> yeah, too right. Yeah. <laughs> so we focus quite a bit on sort of, I guess, the difficulties of being dyslexic as a doctor. But how did you find that your way of thinking helped with being a doctor we've already sort of touched on earlier on about use of visual thinking through your studies but what about now you're in practice yeah so i think in practice um i think there's a lot of things that um i i felt i was probably i probably had you know the things i struggled with the, the reading the writing um uh, there was a lot of things that i think my d- dyslexia offered me as, a, as an advantage you know it's it the things I struggled with and the things that I had kind of maybe a more natural uh, affinity for. I think, uh, you know, the, uh, we talked about kind of uh, my, my uh, ability in, in, say, anatomy to, to, to visualize uh, 3D concepts and things like that was was very useful. Um, it kind of also translated to more practical uh, procedures and things within uh, within the, the clinical setting. Uh, so certainly I, I felt like I, I never really struggled in, in sort of the the very practical aspects of the job 
um, communication skills, my uh, my sort of verbal communication skills, my my listening, talking was um, probably above above par. And I certainly found I I, I never found that challenging. Um, so I, I tend to tended to um, be very good at um, uh, you know uh, gleaning information out of um, out of patients and and, and draw, drawing that drawing on that information to come to kind of the the correct conclusions and, and then there's that lateral that sort of lateral uh thinking as well you know so um taking sometimes desperate pieces of in, in, information and yeah. uh, piecing them together which is kind of um uh you know uh, clearly very relevant you know, um for, for for kind of uh, clinical practice um so yeah i felt like that probably came uh, more naturally than than most uh to me so there's certainly things that i um uh, traits dyslexic traits that that suited suit suit to medicine very well yeah, uh, as well as yeah. the kind of difficulties that come with kind of uh, learning large amounts of information, usually in the form of textbooks um, and lectures. <laughs> yes, um, yeah. yeah. So I can imagine it's quite satisfying as well, isn't it, when you pull these disparate bits of information together and gone, I think it's this, and then they're proven right. Yeah, absolutely. And you do, you know, you do, you do get that sort of, you know, for for all the. Uh, the, the sort of the coughs, the calls, the chest infections, you do get those kind of um, uh, more unusual things. And, and, and it's uh, always a bit of a thrill when you, um, when you manage to, uh, yeah, put through and, and spot the anomaly, really. Yeah, it, it is very satisfying. There's lots of very satisfying things about, um, uh, ab- about medicine. And there's uh, similarly lots of, lots of frustrating bits as well. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> I can only imagine. So, you, you're kind of going along working as a doctor and how did the shifting gear go from you're going to start a business we've kind of touched on it with you saying about using shifting technology at uni and probably not getting as much as you want out of it but then you do medine call uh, where did that come from yeah so i um i was at yes yeah, so i was at university um and one of the things one of the sh- shocks i had going to, to to medical school was you know i was pretty happy that I was kind of going to a science-based course. You know, it was the thing I was um, pretty good at at school, mm. and I was going to go into a, a science-based course. And um, and then I turned up and I got my kind of lecture notes in these kind of big um, uh, big pamphlets and um, and sort of started to flick through. And I the language that was being used was so complicated. You know, these enormous words that meant absolutely nothing to me. Um, and I really realized I was kind of, or I felt very out of my depth very quickly. And then I was obviously challenged with using that lexicon and that complex vocabulary, um, which became even more challenging. And the annoying thing about medicine is you've not just got, a, you know, complex words and a huge number of them. Um, and by a huge number, you know, this is kind of the size of some languages. You know, it's a huge amount of vocabulary. Um, they're also esoteric often between American and English. So, um, lots of I's and E's the other way around. So you've got multiple ways of spelling the same word, which oh, for nice. somebody like me who dyslexic, <laughs> it was just, you know, an absolute yeah, nightmare yeah. situation. I could never kind of actually commit these words to um to to memory. And then I had my sort of assistive technology that I've been provided throughout um for our university. And I thought, oh, well I can kind of draw on uh draw on using some of those those tools. But I unfortunately found that um lots of them also didn't understand that complex terminology so you know you type in um yeah whatever it is and it underlines it with a squiggly red underline even if you spelt it correctly and then you right click and there's no option for what it could be or you use some dictation software and you say the word dysuria and it types the word dishwasher you know uh, yes, that sort yeah. of <laughs> thing so i felt a little bit uh like yeah i just felt uh, a bit lost and uh, and and kind of um kind of needed a bit of extra support so i kind of looked for some software that might help uh, and it just so happened my my uh, one of my good friends at university he he had english as a second language and was having similar challenges um, with the with the terminology and having found nothing that existed that did what we wanted um, we we decided to build build the thing ourselves okay. um, so yeah so that's kind of how we how i kind of got into uh, assistive technology uh, really by by building a tool for for basically me and my friend to to yeah. use ourselves Oh, nice. What exactly yeah. does the tool do? Um, yeah, so the, the software is uh, a piece of software that will provide you with, um, it basically augments your computer um, and the software tools that you use to better understand and utilize healthcare terminology. So the software is called Medincal. 
Um, and um, if you're using dictation software, it will plug in and augment that piece of software so that you can talk, you know, uh, medical jargon at it, and it will understand it and transcribe it into um, into uh, into to, to medical uh, words or maybe using just a word processor and it will augment the spell checker to understand medical terminology or word prediction software or mind mapping software. Yeah, so basically it gives kind of, I guess it gives your computer a, a, a kind of a medical boost um, so it kind of understands <laughs> uh, understands all that kind of uh, that jargon, which, um, yeah, it's a, if, if like me, you struggle with, with words and text uh, and then you're sort of grappling with the complexities of healthcare lingo, um, it uh, certainly uh, was a bit of a lifesaver. Oh, nice. Yeah, I like that idea that you just kind of, because it's not quite the same extent when studying engineering degree, because don't use as much Latin, do use jargon, but it's, it's giving all the physics jargon to it. And eventually the software, by the time I had finished with four years, it knew most of the engineering terms, but actually having something out of the box that would plug the terms in so it knew what was going on in the first place. By the time you knew the terms, it probably knew the terms, whereas it would have been handy for it to know them, you know, maybe before you did. <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, <laughs> absolutely. Yeah, stop lower casing Newton. <laughs> yeah, that, exactly. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, no, that's, oh, I like that idea. So did that then spill into what is now CareScribe? Is it, did you feel that as a logical extension or did that come from somewhere completely different? Yeah, so um, in a way, it, it kind of fed in. So, I mean, I, I kind of started um, medical back in 2013, and that was never intended to be, uh, you know, a, bi- a business. It was uh, a piece of software, as I say, we kind of built for ourselves, and it, it sort of turned into our peers asking us if they could use it, and then <laughs> yeah. the, the, the university we were at took on uh, a, a license to the software for, for, for all the students, and and then um, more universities and other educational and and sort of healthcare institutions did the same, and it kind of over time turned into turned it into a business. Um, but kind of simultaneously, I kind of had left medical school and, and started to practicing as a as a doctor in the NHS. And and, and kind of with that, I, I liked lots of aspects of medicine. But I was I was practicing uh, so when I was kind of a junior doctor. It was the, the kind of the first time the junior doctor strikes came around. Um, yeah, so history repeats. But this was mm. back then. It, it was. It was quite a challenging work environment. Um, and I didn't feel particularly fulfilled by it. I, as I say, I kind of liked, liked lots, lots of aspects of it, but there was bits of it I, I felt pretty dissatisfied with. Um, okay. I, I, um, I guess the kind of the, the key bits were that I, I, I always, uh, I'm very creative. I like, I like being creative. Um, within medicine, it's um, quite rightly quite algorithmic, and I kind of found at times that I kind of was wasn't really able to kind of uh, you know flex that creative muscle really, and um, yeah, yeah, as much as I, I wanted to, and I'm also kind of malignantly ambitious, and um, <laughs> in medicine again, quite rightly, um, you progress through um, through through medicine um, in a very structured structured way, yeah, and. I found it kind of, you know, <laughs> you could be the the best surgeon that ever walked the earth, but it will take you X amount of time. And uh, I kind of, you know, as I say, I had this kind of malignant ambition. I wanted to kind of always get there a bit quicker. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, I started to get a bit frustrated. And what I found was, and that then paired, I guess, with the junior doctor strikes, which was quite a toxic kind of time and mm. uh, to work as a, a junior doctor in, in, in the NHS, um, it kind of just left me quite dissatisfied and the more dissatisfied I came became in my day job the more I kind of turned to this kind of software that I'd built and was people were using and finding uh, of interest and started to kind of you know and um, pour that kind of that ambition and that uh, want to be creative into into that um and the more I did that the more sort of successful it became um and the more I wanted to do it um, and what kind of started off as a bit of a vice became kind of um, more of a passion. Um, yeah. And uh, I started to kind of integrate into the the world of uh, assistive technology and and um, I guess kind of see, um, you know, see the, the the problems that I felt that I could solve. And then off the back of that started to build other pieces of, uh, of technology. Oh, nice. Cool. So, so did you swap into that full time? Was you still kind of part time at? That point in your life. So I was, um, I was full time in, in medicine for, uh, yeah, quite a long time. So I did, I worked full 
full time in medicine for a couple of years. Then I uh, in the NHS. Then I went overseas and I worked in Australia oh, wow. um, as a as a as a doctor um, for uh, a few years. Um, and um, yeah, absolutely, absolutely loved uh, loved that. And whilst I was over in Australia, um, the, the the business and the software that I built at University Medical started to become more and more popular, and that really drew me back um, to the to the UK and um, to go part time then in 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 um, in clinical medicine and, and focus on 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 the business. And it's really when I kind of gave it that extra bit of time, that you know that that extra bit of focus, that um, it, it really started to to rock it. So um, so yeah, so I worked part time for a little while, and then I. And then, just as we were about to launch, uh, kind of CareScribe and, uh, and and CareScribe products, um, the pandemic happened, <laughs> which uh, yeah. yeah was was interesting for multiple reasons, both for launching a software company, but also for being a, a clinician. You know, so um, yes, yeah, see, of course, yeah, yes. that was uh, was was challenging. Um, so yeah, um, so I worked um, throughout the, the the sort of pandemic, and and then and then stopped, uh, kind of clinical medicine to focus on the business which by that point had, had grown quite significantly with uh yeah lots of lots of staff lots of customers and um yeah lots of work to do yeah so airscribe didn't really come out of medical from what i can tell when two different companies or is it a shift from medical into airscribe or are they two very different branches yeah, so they're two separate companies. Um, yeah. So, so Medin- Medincool is still going great guns with um, myself and 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 Niels. We still we still run that business, and it's um, yeah, it's um, very successful, and the products have been used all over the world, um, which is fantastic. Mm. Um, Carescribe kind of kind of came out of it in the sense that it was Medincool that that generated my interest and passion for assistive technology, um, mm. and and I guess for business as well. Uh, but then when we set it up. I set it up as uh, uh, it's a, it's a separate business, and I actually uh, founded it with um, uh, uh, my brother, uh, mm-hmm. who's one of the co-directors and co-founders, um, and a friend of mine, uh, Tom, uh, who okay. is uh, our CTO, uh, so our chief technical officer. Um, so we founded that together, um, and um, and then built built that company together. Okay, so what is its purpose? Because obviously, there's a lot of assistive technology around, and various companies do various things. And what is do you see Carescribe's purpose that's different from what's going on on before it existed? Yeah, so uh, I guess um, one of the kind of reasons um, that we we built Carescribe um, is because you know I, I was working in this sort of field of uh, assistive uh, assistive technology and actually part of being in that community and innovating within that space. I was approached by uh, a couple of universities. They basically wanted advice on some problems that they were experiencing, um, which was mainly around captioning and note-taking. Um, so supporting um, supporting students who, who needed um, who needed uh, either either captions, um, um, but also um, transcripts and, and notes as well, and they sort of sat me down and, and set out the the problem that they were they were having and basically said, do you, do you know of anything that exists that's going to um, help us with this with this problem? Or can you think of a, a, a way we can solve it? And I thought it was a really interesting problem. And we kind of looked around and couldn't see anything that really answered the um, issue that they were facing. And I felt like I could innovate and, and, and solve the, the problem. So um, built um, with, with Chris and, and Tom um, a product called Captioned, um, which is our kind of flagship product and uh, we kind of worked on it with uh, in collaboration with uh, a couple of universities and then we launched that back in August 2020 um, and then it's pretty much been non-stop uh, sort of since then and um, we've released other products including talk type and um, have continued to iterate and grow those products and um, you know taking the kind of feedback of our kind of uh, community of, of um, customers and users uh, and and developing the products kind of in line with their needs so yeah so the the uh, the idea was, I guess, when we started Cashcribe, was kind of less of a we we should start an assistive tech company and more of a this is an interesting problem uh, yeah. that you yeah. know we think we can solve. The business kind of just like when I built Medincore, the business kind of formed around it really. And you're more experienced as a business director at that point as well. You kind of use Medincore to practice that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, yeah, like I, I built, I built tech tools before I kind of um I um I understood the landscape of say the UK assisted tech market. I kind of uh I I you know I, I kind of understood how uh, the 
AT is adopted by uh, in education and in the workplace and and things like that. So I had definitely had more of an understanding. But CareScribe has turned into a completely different beast, really, than the medical. It's a, yeah. it's a quite a, a big operation, and um, and I've definitely uh, I wish I'd managed to build CareScribe, kind of knowing everything, having done it all before. Um, <laughs> but that cer- certainly hasn't been the case, and I don't think uh, will be the case going forward either. But, um, uh, but yeah. No. And okay, so if I've downloaded Captioned, or as Captioned, I think it's probably is the dot is throwing me off. Is it Captioned or Captioned? Yeah, dot I, whatever you fancy, <laughs> we call it Captioned, but yeah, whatever uh, you, uh, whatever it's you your company, it. so I go Captioned because <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's Captioned dot ed, and I was like, Captioned, who is this? Ed? <laughs> um, okay, so Captioned. Uh, so I've downloaded it, and this is going to be Engineer's Corner. What what do I expect as the user experience? What is it doing for me? Why have I got it downloaded on my computer? Yeah. Yeah, cool. So um, the problem that we're looking to to solve the the kind of um, um, the, the, the mission of of, um, of captioned is to to help um, support individuals with with disabilities um, to comprehend information and um, to help retain that information as well. So nowadays, you know, I'm sure you can relate to this in, in both work and in education. We are challenged with consuming huge volumes of content and information. You know, in, in university, that would be lectures and seminars and um, uh, and it would be Zoom calls and Teams calls and uh, all sorts of different things. And in, in the workplace, it's much the same. And, you know, it's um, in-person meetings, one-on-one conversations. You've got Zoom calls, Teams calls, but all these different um, interactions you have. Typically, those sort of interactions tend to be sort of 30 minutes to an hour long, which for many people is, you know, it's just not a great way of digesting information. You know, we, we know from um, lots of studies, there's a study by, uh, I think it's the, oh, it's, uh, the American Psychological Society or, or those words in a different order um, okay. that, um, that sort of showed that. Um, in a in a lecture, for instance, you you pay attention for about the first fifteen minutes, um, and then there's been lots of studies since then that have said actually it's ten minutes, actually it's five minutes, all the way down to about eight seconds, um, and I'm certainly <laughs> closer to the eight second end of the spectrum, I think. Um, but um, the average but yeah, video. <laughs> yeah, exactly right. I think I think actually that was based on the amount of time you spend on a on a website or something along yeah. those lines, but. Yeah. Um, but essentially what it isn't is an hour long or 30 minutes long. And, yeah. and that's the general population. So our ability to digest and, and comprehend information, if you're struggling to focus, you're not going to be able to comprehend, you're not going to be able to digest, and you're not going to be able to retain that yes. information. Yeah. If you add on top of that um, a disability, it can make it so much more difficult um, to do exactly that same thing. It can take so much more cognitive function um, to to be able to stay focused, to be able to comprehend um, if you are deaf or have hearing loss and you, you are struggling to hear what's being said and you're going to have to work that extra bit harder to to uh, to lip read to um to you know kind of tune into exactly kind of what's being said or maybe you're as you know dyslexic um like we're talking about here you know and I auditory working memory deficit and I'm I'm really struggling to stay stay focused and take that that information and process it and retain it you just have to work that extra bit harder it just becomes what becomes kind of challenging for most people becomes can quickly become kind of impossible and and that's the that's the problem that we're looking to solve so we, we, the software itself will um will essentially allow you to comprehend that information better as it comes in um, and also retain it and it does that um essentially by taking in uh, the the audio of the interaction and turning it taking that dialogue and turning it into captions instantly so on your screen you will get live text as as the person or people are speaking, which gives you a second modality in which to digest that information. So I could be uh, listening to you and reading what's being said. Most importantly for me, if I miss something you've said, I can see it on my screen or I can scroll back and I can recap on it. And then what I can also do is I can use those captions to take notes. So if you said something particularly important, I can highlight it as important, or I could jot down an extra bit of context. You know, I'll make sure you send Matthew a link to that paper or what have you. Um, I can jot that down. And all that information is saved for me to go back to later. So the audio, the original audio or video of who was speaking and the 
um, visual images that they were sharing, plus the transcript that's been generated and the notes and highlights that you've um, taken um, alongside it. So you can go back in your own time and revisit it. So that is essentially what the what the software does and the, the problem the software is looking to to help users overcome. Okay, it's really interesting. And how are you finding people mostly use it? Are they using it in university lectures or does it work through Zoom calls and things like that? Yeah. So yeah, that that's a that's a really good question. So the the idea of the software is for it to be um the term we use is platform agnostic, which you know is kind of one of those statements so it means kind of what does that mean but um, <laughs> it basically means that you you uh you can you're not tied to something specific so it works on mac it works on windows it works on ios and android devices so you can use it on any device but you can also use it in any situation so if i go to an in-person meeting i could use it if i go to a zoom call i can use it, a teams call if i'm listening to a podcast uh, i can use it if i'm watching a youtube video or a panopto lecture it doesn't matter if there's some dialogue there then you can caption it you can take notes against it and you can take it away with you so yeah and and one of the key things is you know we we've we've always had ideas of how the software can be used you know we sell well this will be really useful in this scenario and that scenario and one of our big challenges or as, as kind of i guess leaders of the business is to um not be too bound to our own concepts of how something should be used not too bound to our own egos uh, to dictate how something should be used and um and be open to uh, the software being used in different ways, and then understanding how it's being used um, to to um, to help to iterate on the product in the direction um, that our customers want to use it. Yeah, and um, seeing as you're putting it out to a neurodiverse community, I imagine they found some entertaining ways that you never thought of for using it. What's your sort of favourite one of them? <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. We, I mean, we found a huge. A, yeah, a huge variation in in the ways the software is being used. You know, from people who just want and um, want to have some captions on something. You know, so that's that kind of um, maybe I can't hear what somebody's saying, and I want some captions on the screen. Um, or for lots of reasons, captions have sort of proved to be very useful to to many of us. In fact, uh, Netflix has shown that eighty percent of its viewers watch Netflix with captions, which is yeah. you know. Oh, wow. Really, inter- a really interesting yeah. stuff. Just yeah, how, yeah. just how useful captions can be, and how how um, broad a usage uh, kind of captions have across a, across the population. Yeah, to to kind of note taking, to uploading media in afterwards. So you know, you might be you're, you work in uh, you might work in HR, for instance, and do grievance meetings where you want to record everything that's being said and have it transcribed, so you can find specific mentions and things later or. And you might work in research and you do qualitative research where you're doing interviews um, and you want to be able to go back and find specific sections of it um, because that's the other big use, you know, video and audio as recording, rec- sort of a, a medium for recordings, it, it's it's not searchable, whereas when it's paired with a transcript, it is. Yeah. So, um, so people find that very useful as well. Interesting, yes, yeah. No, that's really interesting. How are you finding it with, I mean, in my head, I'm sort of like, I've imagined being in the lecture hall and so it's recording the lecture, obviously. How how do you stop it from picking up bits of other chatter? <laughs> is that something yeah. you can do, or is it more is that more a hardware and microphone problem? Yeah, so to a, a bit of a mix, really. Um, it depends what the chatter is. You know, somebody speaking very loudly next to you, yeah, uh, yeah. then you're gonna you're always gonna you're always gonna struggle. But um, we do some audio cleaning, so we can we can clean our background noise to focus on um, the you know the the, uh, the speech that we want to. And then also, as you describe, you know, you can um, you can use different pieces of hardware and um, uh, and microphones and things to to really be able to improve the audio quality. So you might use, for instance, a uh, uh, a little shotgun mic that you point um, at a speaker. Um, you could also use little lapel mics. You know, these aren't expensive bits of kit, but they would, you know, that would be a nice way of improving um, the audio quality if you were in a noisy environment. Um, and then there's other other tools that lots of our customers use. So things like uh, Bonac, you might have come across as um, uh, they, they're a, a company that develop receivers and microphones and hearing devices, predominantly used by people who are deaf or have hearing loss. We're compatible with uh, lots of their equipment. So lots of our customers who use us purely for that kind of captioning element and um, may have some of those devices and they give fantastic quality um, audio. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, we pick up on that audio uh, and those devices also send that audio to the, the user's hearing aid if they have one. So oh, okay. um, yeah, so there's yeah. lots of different tools you can use. Yeah. Um, but yeah. 
does it discern from um, different speakers? So, like, so somebody's using caption captioned to uh, caption this podcast. Would it know who the speakers are? Because obviously your live voices are different, but it's one continuous piece of audio. Yeah, absolutely. So that's um, a kind of a process that has a, a relatively uh, complicated name. It's called speaker diarization, so separating out different speakers from a single uh, audio file. Um, we do some of it, um, and we're actually got a big project ongoing, which finishes in July, which would be um, which will kind of see see us through to kind of. Uh, a new iteration of, of what we do for separating out speakers. So currently, typically, we'll separate out speakers based on kind of new lines and things like that. So um, you will, will, the way we display text isn't as a, con- a continuous stream because that's very difficult to digest. Yes, um, yeah. We automatically punctuate it and we break it up into statement chunks. Um, okay. So we typically typically give a new speaker a new statement chunk. What we are doing at the moment is basically labeling those um, speakers and giving a degree of memory. So if, for instance, uh, there was maybe there's three or four of us on a call, I'm speaker one, you're speaker two, and then there's three and four. And um, if you speak, then it'll say speaker two, and then I'll speak, it'll say speaker one, and then someone else will speak, it'll say speaker four, and it will remember those speakers and and sort of apply them uh, across a across a transcript as well. So that's a piece of work that's going on at the moment for this summer. Yeah, so I was just thinking that'd be really interesting because sometimes I've found with assistive tech is you, you have to sort of sift and do a lot of kind of sifting afterwards to get things out of it where it's kind of it's nicer when they start building more and more stuff onto them with it. It's already kind of clean by the time you've got to it to use it as the end user. Yeah, exactly. Like, I mean, that's kind of one of the things, you know, one of the key things within Captioned is we've been working with sort of speech recognition since sort of 2013 and um, have, you know, uh, and, you know, that's a big part of kind of what we do. So transcription and, and, and speech recognition. And we within Captioned have a very high level of accuracy so that they're, they're taking the uh, the the audio and turn it into text, getting the the highest level of accuracy. So those words resembling what's been said, we have a very high level of accuracy. And um, there, but it's never going to be 100. No, um, no. And a human won't be 100. percent So the other kind of key thing is is being able to go in and easily edit that transcript afterwards, um, which is actually very complicated to do. And um, uh, you know, had we had our engineering team. Um, working uh, for a long time on perfecting that, uh, but go, being able to go back in and edit those those transcripts, and you think every word within a transcript relates to a bit of audio or a bit of video, and it relates to the words either side, and what happens when you add a word or take a word out or split it into paragraphs. So that was a big piece of work. So um, yeah, we have offer a very high level of accuracy, and also that kind of ability to go in and edit a transcript because. What we know is like, you know, if you often when you when you look at editing a transcript, it can take about two to three times as long as the length of the transcript. Yes. So yes. what we want to do is make that as quick and uh, processed as possible. Uh, yeah. So that's yeah, something we've been working on. Yeah, 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 definitely. So where did um, talk type come out of this? Because I get the feeling captioned was the lead product and then you rolled into talk type. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, caption was probably a kind of flagship product that we were kind of uh, working on, but it was still in sort of core to it was speech recognition and, and speech to text kind of functionality. Um, and then what happened was we were kind of approached again by a lot of our customers in the assistive technology kind of arena. Um, who basically was were talking about problem they were having surrounding dictation. So, yeah. um, they um. One of the key ones at the time was that there was a very popular piece of dictation software and yeah. a huge, huge organization that's used to kind of, uh, uh, yeah, it's used by a, a lot of users and it's kind of much loved. Um, mm-hmm. And they stopped supporting Mac computers. Oh. Um, so they supported Mac for a long time and they, they kind of stopped supporting um, those users, which um, left a lot of people who, who, who liked that software kind of uh, left in the lurch. Yeah, um, yeah. So that kind of community came to us and similar to how the universities had come to us with the, the kind of question around captioning and note taking, they said, is there anything you can think of, anything you can do? And again, because we were kind of working in that space, we sort of thought, well, actually, yes, we're perfectly positioned to be able to um, offer an alternative. And that's really where kind of TalkType came from. So um, mm-hmm. uh, we built, uh, initially we built TalkType as a, as a Mac only uh, dictation software. Um, yeah, yeah. that um, allows people to build documents with the, the power of their voice and also navigate their computer. Mm-hmm. Um, and it turned out to be really, really popular. And then the 
biggest demand we had uh, once we'd launched it was, can I use this on my Windows computer? So, um, <laughs> so what was originally, uh, you know, going to be Mac only, we ended up building for um, for mobile devices and for for Windows. Um, yes. So yeah, kind of cross cross platform, uh, and the idea there is to give the the customer a really high level of uh, accuracy when they're dictating. So um, again, making sure that the the words you say are the ones that are represented in text on the screen, and um, make it quick. So you're not saying something and then waiting for uh, you know um, even yes. a couple of seconds that <laughs> inevitably feel like minutes. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, for the text to appear, um, and then also keep it simple because um, mm. what we what we find is um, with assistive tech or any tech the more complicated it is the, the lower the adoption often so we wanted to keep it really oh, simple goodness. really easy to yes. use uh, and people loved that so um yeah yeah interesting isn't it huh? one business decision and not support mac anymore gives you an opening and then you go to windows yeah. as well it's kind of somebody's face palming in your competitor <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah I, yeah i'm sure they'll be absolutely absolutely fine uh, knowing them but um but yeah, yeah it's yeah. um it's uh yeah it's just kind of one of those and you know we do things in quite quite different ways um, mm. as well and um and you know really good products um you know both both them and us um but yeah you you quite right you know an opening came up and um and we we thought again just just like pretty much everything we've built is you know a, a problem emerges and um kind of the way both chris tom and i think it's kind of well we let's think of a solution you know Yes, definitely. And, yeah, that's where all the best businesses come from, isn't it? People finding solutions to problems. <laughs> Absolutely. And like, you know, we talk about dyslexia, we're, we're solution orientated as, yes. uh, you know, as, as founders, all three of us are, are, are dyslexic. And, and that is the way in which we find our mind works. And we think that is why we've kind of, you know, uh, thus far been successful you know it's kind yeah, of um, yeah. those those, um, those sort of skill sets are kind of um, inherent to the way our, our brains work and um, yeah and it's it's kind of works I think for, for entrepreneurship yeah most definitely okay so this brings me to um, sort of the end section of the show so to speak so each guest on this podcast gets three rapid fire questions they don't need quick answers from you they're quick questions from me so do you fancy diving into question number one I think that's a loaded question, and hopefully your first question. So my answer is yes. And now I've only got two questions left, <laughs> right? <laughs> oh, you need to see if you can be that clever about the answer to the rest of that. <laughs> yeah, and the answer to that is no. <laughs> <laughs> okay, then. So question number one, what prejudice have you had about dyslexia to been proven wrong? For me, I think... I I I, always, I often felt quite stupid in mm. main school in, ma- in mainstream education. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, I I my uh, my feeling of self worth was pretty low. I, I think generally, um, the, well, yeah, the, the way mainstream education is set up is is um, for lots of reasons um, is is predicated on on usually learning written text and and the, the that process and and listening to people and comprehending information that way and that did not work work for me um as it did for my uh, contemporaries and um and that left me with the uh, a kind of a a feeling of um yeah i think being a bit, bit stupid um or yeah and, and not really seeing what what value i had to to offer and i think that as i've as i've kind of i think started to work in business and and business leadership that's very much changed because um i've been able to yeah kind of see the value i guess that that i bring um the, the others um don't and um and kind of yeah and and um see that as my my own usp really yeah yeah definitely and it's great to sort of shake the shackles off of that kind of thing isn't it yeah absolutely and um yeah because it's definitely not true and um, yes yeah as as is everywhere um you know it, well in the you know edi space you know um dyslexia you know has more strengths than you know people with dyslexia have more strengths than they do weaknesses and um, those are very very valuable so um mm-hmm. yeah 100 percent, 100 percent. okay then. moving on to question number two if an alien landed and you had to describe dyslexia to them how would you do it that's it Another very good question. Um, <laughs> I think I would explain that um, there are um, 
we have a yeah, I would say that we have a um, as a race we have a diverse um, a diverse makeup. People's brains work in different ways, um, and there are a portion of people um, uh, on the planet that have uh, a brain that is um, uh, that, that thrives not on uh, absorbing uh, information in certain ways. Um, and has great benefits in other ways. Um, you know, I basically just I think talk about the diversity of uh, of, of people's brain types, really. Um, and and uh, dyslexia is just one way in which some some people's brains function. Um, that has big strengths in some areas. People find challenges in other areas. Um, yeah, I think that's probably how I'd I'd tackle yeah. that one. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the final sort of serious question of the podcast. And you're not allowed to use your own products as the answer for this question. Um, seeing as this is the Dyslexia Life Hack show, what is your favourite Dyslexia Life Hack? Oh, I would have. Uh, that's a very good question. What is my favourite Dyslexia Life Hack? Which doesn't involve my uh, yeah. our, our product. <laughs> um, um, I th- for me, it would be mind mapping. Yeah, okay. I find my mapping is the best way for me to conceptualize uh, information uh, and to, to process it. So I use mm. mind maps in pretty much uh, everything I do. I, I find that that way of laying out information is much better for me to absorb um, than anything else. Back at medical school, when I had to rote learn information, I used to get, I did have software that did mind mapping, uh, mind mapping but I actually used uh, huge A1 pieces of paper, A0 pieces of paper and pin them all over the uh, walls and then yeah. um, would draw kind of mind maps of, um, you know, the, the Krebs cycle and different ways yeah. in which enzymes work and all this sort of stuff. And I found that um, way of conceptualizing uh, information was, um, yeah, was was probably the thing actually probably one of the key things that got me through that that bit of uh, yeah. medical school actually do you still use that approach today for my maps all, all the time yeah all the time um and um yeah you know when we're when we're talking about um products and the way of uh, developing certain features and functions you know i'll always turn to turn to a mind map even things like preparing um speeches or talks or documents i always will start from a from um from a from a mind map um, because it's it's the best way for me to um, see information and um, piece together um, that information and then create a you know create a cohesive narrative from it really. Yeah, no, that was a great hack, and there's quite a few people that mention that. It's something I need to do more often. As you were talking, I was like, I can think of a better. Plan. I can think of how to use that at work. We need yeah. to sort of get into it more often. Okay. So before we sign off, is there anything else you'd like to add and where can people find you? Yeah, just to say thank you very much for inviting me onto onto your no podcast. It's um, yeah, a real privilege to be able to um uh yeah, come and talk with you. Uh if, if anybody wants to find out more about um, me or, or um or any of our products or businesses, then um yeah, I um uh, you can find us at uh, carescribe.io. So mm-hmm. uh, look us up, get in touch. Um always happy to happy to talk. Uh, or, or yeah, just have a quick Google of any of our, our products and you'll quickly find us. No problem. And I'll link to all of them in the show notes as well. So thanks very much. That just leaves me to thank you very much for taking the time to come on the podcast. Likewise. Thanks so much for having us. Thank you. No problem at all. And I want to thank everybody else for taking the time to listen. And I'll talk to you in the next episode. Goodbye for now.